be seated so that we can uh, begin the events of the evening. And before I introduce um, Dr. Michelle Lewis to you, I'd like to just first of all extend a warm word of welcome uh, to each and every one of you, uh, especially those of you who are visiting the campus and especially those of you who might be here uh, for the first time. Uh, those of you who are here for the first time, uh, at the end of this session, there's a uh, little white cards for you to fill out so you just put your name on the mailing list. Uh, for the students, uh, the sign-up sheets uh, for your present at the colloquia, those will also be present. Uh, th th those will also be on the table in, on the, in the back here. Uh, also, uh, for those visiting, uh, just so you know, those who might be looking for restrooms, if you go out this door and you make a left, the restrooms are right down the hall, straight ahead. Um, follow, immediately following uh, the lecture this evening, uh, there are refreshments, and we invite you to please uh, join us and stay with us uh, as we enjoy some refreshments at the end. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Michelle Loris, who needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Uh, Dr. Loris is the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. She's Chair of the Catholic Studies Department and does many, many, many things here at Sacred Heart University. And among other things, she is the initiator of the Regalio Lecture Series. And last year was the first uh, and last year, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the Pope representative of the United States, uh, gave the first Regolio Lecture, and this year uh, will be the second annual Regolio Lecture. So uh, we thank Michelle for starting this wonderful program, uh, and also for all the other wonderful things that she does here at Sacred Heart, day in and day out. And she will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Father. Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to our second annual Bergoglio Lecture. Thank you so much for being here. I know the weather was working against us, but um, we promised you a really rich and robust evening. Uh, it's really, truly my honor to introduce our esteemed speaker this evening, Dr. Massimo Fagioli. And we really could have no more fitting a speaker for the Bergoglio Lecture than Massimo Fagioli. The Bergoglio Lecture is meant to honor the work of Pope Francis and his engagement with the contemporary world. It's meant to reflect the Pope's efforts to continue and develop the spirit of Vatican II and to extend the flourishing of the Catholic intellectual tradition in our contemporary life. And in this way, Dr. Fagioli's work represents all of this and more. Dr. Fagioli is arguably the leading scholar on Vatican II he is the leading authority on the history and administration of the inner workings of the Catholic Church. He is a recognized scholar on Pope Francis and his work. And he is a leading authority on American Catholicism and Catholicism and world politics. Dr. Fagioli received his doctorate in theology from the University of Turin and his BA and MA from the University of Bologna with honors and distinction. He's a professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University. He has lectured across North and Latin America, Europe, Asia, and his numerous publications include some 10 books, several articles, essays, book reviews, commentaries, and documentaries, as well as publications in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. He's a contributing editor to Commonweal Magazine, so I'm delighted also to say that as of today, having received an honorary doctorate from Sacred Heart University, Dr. Fagiolia is a member of the Sacred Heart University community. So welcome, my colleague. Dr. Fagioli's work represents the flourishing of the Catholic intellectual tradition in our world today. It is rooted in the rigorous intellectual inquiry for knowledge and truth. It is interdisciplinary, it engages the issues of our contemporary world, and it stimulates ongoing and thoughtful uh, conversation. So tonight, we eagerly look forward to your talk on Pope Francis in the USA, theology, politics, and diplomacy, and to the engaged conversation that we look forward to following your talk. 
It is my distinct honor and pleasure to present Dr. Massimo Fettori. Good evening, and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, in this weather, I, I understand uh, that it was particularly treacherous today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here also because uh, it is a comeback. I spoke here in 2012, um, and it seems so long ago, but uh, so it, I feel home here, really. Um, this is a particular time to talk about Pope Francis because uh, next Monday it will be five years since uh, Pope Benedict announced his resignation. So it's been four, it's been five years already, and it's a cycle. And, and after five years, there are some trends, some. Uh, trajectories uh, of every position or leadership that we can assess after five years. Tonight, I'm going to focus on one specific issue that I was, and I'm lucky enough to observe as a European Catholic who moved to the United States 10 years ago. And right in the middle of these last 10 years, the change of pontificate happens. So the first five years were under Pope Benedict and these last five years under Pope, Pope Francis. That has been interesting to observe. Uh, but it's not just a personal issue because there is an argument to be made about the special, the particular role of the United States and of American Catholicism in the Catholic Church of today and in uh, the relationship between this Catholic Church and Pope Francis. So what I'm trying to do is to divide my observations on Pope Francis and the and USA in three parts. One, the theological uh, gaps or frictions between Francis and uh, North American Catholicism. The second part on what it means to be a pope from Argentina speaking on some issues uh, in terms of the, of the domestic political alignments in the United States. And the third part will be more about uh, diplomacy or better, uh, more about the geopolitics of the Catholic Church. So how the uh, different islands or areas of Catholicism, I mean, how they are moving uh, in our time and what Francis Pontificate means uh, for this movement of these different areas on the, on the globe of the Catholic Church. So first, the, the, uh, the theological gaps that there are between Pope Francis and North American Catholicism uh, here, there is much that should be said uh, about the specific uh, theological roots of Pope Francis. I know that the liturgical press is translating a very important book that has been published in Italy a few months ago on the intellectual biography of Pope Francis. It's going to be published in English by liturgical press next fall. Uh, so, I'm not going into what's different between a typical North American Catholic bishop and a typical uh, Latin American Jesuit, uh, or atypical Latin American Jesuit like, uh, like Francis. I'm going to focus on, specifically, on what's different between the reception and the understanding of the Second Vatican Council in Pope Francis and in uh, North American Catholicism. There's no question that that is the major difference. For most of the Catholic world, Vatican II was a good thing. Can I be more blunt? <laughs> it was a good thing. 
uh, that had problems, made mistakes, but there's no question that, that Vatican II uh, is the basis of Catholic theology. Uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, Europe, or, or Australia. In the United States, it's different because, especially in these last 20 years, more or less, what happened at Vatican II, 1962, 1965, and what happened especially in the post Vatican II period after 1965 has been subject to uh, a series of uh, disputes that do not revolve around the theology of the Second Vatican Council. So were those documents good, good Catholic theology or bad Catholic theology? But the argument is mostly about what Vatican II did or didn't do to stop a certain uh, decay of North American Christianity and of North American Catholicism. So uh, the lens is mostly so, uh, sociological and, and political. Uh, to be very, very uh, honest, uh, the argument against Vatican II in the US is basically blaming Vatican II of uh, not stopping or accelerating a certain sociological decline and political uh, thinning of American Catholicism. This is a very North American, this is a very US way of looking at the Second Vatican Council, which is not the way Francis looks at that. Uh, we could be very specific. Uh, there are some documents that say a lot about how a, a Catholic reads or understands the Second Vatican Council, the most uh, telling is the document on the Church in the Modern World, uh, titled Gaudium et Spes, the last document published by the Second Vatican Council. So which is the document that basically recapitulates the whole Second Vatican Council in one document saying this is the kind of church we want in the modern world. If you like Gaudium et Spes, you like Vatican II. <laughs> if you don't like Gaudium et Spes, you have a more complicated relationship with the Second Vatican Council. And so Pope Francis is a, is a Gaudium et Spes pope. Uh, pope Francis uses Vatican II in a very, I mean, a sophisticated way, but there's no question that for him the entirety of the Second Vatican Council, what happened there and the documents are the basis of the Catholic Church of today. This is not uh, what happens um, in, in some important quarters or circles, uh, milieus, uh, journals, magazines of North American Catholicism that have a more complicated relationship with the Second Vatican Council and especially with those documents of the Council, like Gaudium et Spes, that have a more optimistic relationship with the modern world. That's the whole problem. Um, <coughs> there is, in Gaudium et Spes, so what is more most important and best is a positive assessment and an acceptance of the way of, of the fact that Catholics who live in a world that is ideologically diverse, um, that is a world in transition, is in evolution, even if Gaudium Spes didn't want to use evolution because they didn't want to deal with Darwin and the and all that. But, uh, so that was the idea. A changing world and a world that is secular and a secular dimension that shouldn't scare uh, the church. <coughs> These are very difficult concepts to accept for a Catholicism that rejects or criticizes the Second Vatican Council. And if there's one huge difference 
between how Francis speaks about the modern world and modern politics is his disarming acceptance of the, of the fact that we live in a secular world. And for example, when he speaks a, a, about modern politics, he says basically, thank God we live in secular states. Because he says uh, confessional states in Catholic history, uh, they have almost always uh, meant a perversion of Catholicism. So he says, we don't want to go back to being a church enslaved to political power or vice versa. And for a certain kind of American Catholicism, the very idea of the secular uh, cannot be positive. It's unimaginable that the secular dimension, secularity, can be understood in a positive way. There is a huge cultural difference there, that it's not about being liberal or conservative, the two worlds. So in this sense, France is, is much closer to, to European Catholicism, Latin American Catholicism, and a Catholicism that lives in a condition of minority. Because if you know that your, your church is not a dominating church, you see the secular state, which means neutral, you see that as blessing, as, as safe for you. But if you start from the understanding that your church or Christianity should be the dominating cultural social force, of course, secularity for you is a step back. So here there's a radical difference between these two uh, worlds, not just intellectually, but how you see Catholicism in the path of history. And so Francis sees Catholicism in, in a particular place that has gone beyond the dream of living in a Christian society, where everybody is Christian or is supposed to. And, and those who, who don't like Vatican II tend to think about Catholicism as something that can recover, or that should recover, that position, that moment when being Christian, being Catholic, was the majority, was the dominating force. These are different uh, worlds. So here, Gadim Espes really plays an important role uh, there are many other documents where you, you, you can see a real difference between Francis and uh, American Catholicism, for example, on uh, religious liberty. Uh, the document on religious liberty, Vatican II says religious liberty is a fundamental right of every human being because we are created in the image of God. Your freedom doesn't depend on what is your religion but it's because you're a human being. In America, this argument on religious liberty tends to be articulated in a way that is less theological and more constitutional, for obvious reasons, because Americans came up with this idea of religious liberty way before Vatican II. So there is a right of, of having been there first. And there's a lack of understanding, in my opinion, that the theological argument for religious liberty is a bit different from the constitutional argument, first amendment. <coughs> so here Francis is articulating religious freedom in a different uh, way. Um, so there are many other things on the different interpretations of the Second American Council that we should do, that we could say. Um, on the liturgical reform, so Pope Francis uh, never displayed any nostalgia for the liturgical style of the Catholic Church before Vatican II for the Latin Mass. For him, saying Mass in the vernacular according to the reform that was passed between 1963 and 64 is the most natural thing. We know that one of the centers of a certain liturgical neo-traditionalism 
So going back to the old right in mass and so on, is in the United States, is in the English-speaking world, and particularly the United States, for a variety of reasons. So here again, you have you have some tension because because Pope Francis had to uh, accommodate the provisions that had been made by his predecessor for these groups or these individuals who think that the Latin mass is, is more mass or is more capital. But clearly this is not Francis. Uh, he had to, to, to do that because he cares for the unity of the church, uh, but it's not, not him. So to conclude this first point is that we have in the Catholic Church one Second Vatican Council. So all the bishops of the Second Vatican Council together for four years, 2,500 bishops from all over the world, the biggest council in the history of the Catholic Church, all, the, all these documents approved with majority of 97, 98, 99%. So, it is, uh, so we have one council. The problem is that we have many post-Vatican II periods. So the post-Vatican II in North America is different from Latin America, from Europe, Asia, Africa. And what is specific of the perception of the post-Vatican II in North America, in the United States especially, is the difficulty to distinguish what is Vatican II, what is that Catholicism, and what is usually known as the 60s. It is in my experience of a European Catholic, uh, so we had 1968, we had political terrorism and so on, but it's, it's not identified, Vatican II, with the turmoil of the 60s, which is the most usual, typical thing to do in this context, because it's a different history. Um, it, I'm not accusing anybody of obsessions of any kind. It's a different post vatican period because of the civil rights movement, because of Vietnam, because of Nixon, because of it, it's a different history. And so here Francis has put that into question again because he comes from a world that is perceived as more different for North American than <laughs> The previous different uh, difference with a, a, a European Pope. The gap is perceived more drastically. Uh, the, uh, the idea was that the Vatican II and the post-Vatican II of North America and of Europe under John Paul II and Benedict the XVI, it was a coherent picture. With Francis, the whole map gets stretched, and it's not just the map, it's the, it's the narrative of Catholicism that gets stretched. So now, if I, if I had a PowerPoint, I would show a picture of global Catholicism being really under tension. Uh, north, south, east, west, it's, it's really a map under pressure, and not because of this pope. I, I think Francis has, has brought to the surface something that was there already. He certainly hasn't created that. Second point is this pontificate and uh, domestic politics, uh, American politics. And here, I should, I should be uh, more cautious than usual because I'm on a green card. <laughs> when they give you a green card, they, they, they tell you, you don't make political speeches. Uh, so. Anyway, uh, the most important thing is here the difficulty to understand the political message of this pope. I mean, every pope has a political message. John Paul, Benedict, Paul VI. But the difficulty is to understand the political message of this Pope in categories that are not liberal or conservative. 
So there has been, in the first few weeks of this pontificate, the attempt of conservatives of labeling him as a conservative, it didn't last very long. It didn't. I mean, after the summer 2013, it vanished. But it has continued the attempt to test the political message of Pope Francis in terms of how liberal he is. Which means, is he a good pope or a bad pope? So this is a reflection of domestic politics uh, that is, again, typical of the North American Catholic, the U.S. Catholic context, uh, which is a more polarized Catholic Church, uh, which is, I believe, a reflects and mirroring of, 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 the, of the, uh, the political polarization. It's, it's a two-party system that, in this church, tends to see issues in the spectrum of a two-party church. And, of course, the papacy tends to be seen in this spectrum. So here, as we know, Pope Francis is, a, is for the church, for the poor, which has nothing to do with the idea of liberalism. It's a completely different history. I mean, liberalism is not really that, that enthusiast with, with uh, the church of the poor. But here, the oversimplification of the ideological spectrum in one side and the other side has produced a polarized uh, vision of what this pope uh, is is about, in my experience as a Catholic and as a theologian coming from Europe and having traveled the world in these last few years, um, even in contexts that have some similarities with uh, North America like uh, uh, Australia, there are theological divisions but they are not ideologically polarized, partisan way like it. So this is something that is really part of, uh, of, this, of uh, the, this pontificate because, and this is especially visible in the Catholic, in the intra-Catholic uh, debate in these last few months and years, the whole debate seems to be between liberal Catholicism or anti-liberal Catholicism. So there is a big debate raging on liberalism, anti-liberalism, um, and that tends to uh, distort the picture of this of, uh, of, uh, of this pontificate, which is inherently allergic to any polarizing narrative. So one of the things that made of uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio the Pope Francis we know, is the experience of a Catholic Church in Argentina that was really lacerated by a civil war. And so he, his ecclesiology of the people, uh, of the community, uh, of a very unity-based church, where it doesn't, it's not important if you're a, a bishop or a cleric or a nun, you are part of the people, is exactly the opposite of a partisan narrative. But in a partisan context, if you refuse the partisan narrative, that can be read only in a partisan way. And so this is the predicament in which Francis um, is in, I think. Um, so the domestic politics language and uh, positioning as an impact on reading this pope that I haven't seen anywhere else. <coughs> for, for the reason that no other, from no other political system, 
is so solidified in a two-party system. And so usually there are still three <laughs> or four. I mean, it, it's more difficult for a German Catholic or an Italian Catholic, a French Catholic, an Australian Catholic to have two options and to read everything according to that picture. So this is really, I, I think, part of, 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 the, of the, uh, this particular debate. Uh, third part, diplomacy and uh, geopolitics. So here, the most obvious thing that we could say about Pope Francis is that uh, he has redrawn the map of how the papacy looks at world Catholicism. Uh, if you build a map of the countries that Pope Francis has visited, they are, the majority of them, non-European countries. They are in the peripheries. And uh, the European countries he visited are only in the peripheries of Catholic Europe. So Sweden and Greece, uh, Bosnia and Turkey, uh, the island of the migrants, refugees, Lampedusa. So he carefully avoids the usual uh, tour of uh, the Pope in Catholic places. Uh, so that's very different. So of the 24 international trips of Pope Benedict, of 24, 15 were in Europe. In France, in Spain, in the UK, in Germany, yeah. it's a it's a very different different map. First, second, for a few weeks, a few months after Francis's election, if you try to say, well, he's the first pope of the Americas, he's speaking for the whole American continent, that didn't last very long. Again, it's one of the illusions that this pontificate. Uh, is a pope that I think has really uh, been honest about the fact that the American continent is less united or more split than, than the church believed until the 1980s, 1990s. The synod for the, for the Americans from Alaska to Chile. It's, it's a different picture of the Catholic Church. Um, in an interview that he gave a few months ago, Pope Francis talks about how his, his papacy looks at the, the, uh, the world, uh, talking about Magellan's gaze. He talks about the history of this uh, explorer uh, who, 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 who understood the world, I mean, how complicated the world was only when he, he was at the farthest point from his native land. And so he, he, he said, the Catholic Church, so Francis said, the Catholic Church basically needs to decenter itself, decentralize itself, and look at the peripheries first. Because the peripheries of of the globe, of a nation, of a city, of a campus, the peripheries are the ones who tell you the situation. Like Italy, if you want to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to understand Italy, don't go to the Spanish steps. I mean, that's the last, last place you have to go because it's all glamour. It's all. So you should go somewhere else. And so Francis said that we should start looking at the world from the, from the geographical peripheries, from the existential peripheries, which means those who, don't, who, who are not in the news every day, so those who don't make news, those who are marginalized, and so on. So he's making an argument that is clearly on one side of those who live on this earth. And so he has said, he has done things that are clearly presenting a Catholic Church, a papacy, 
that has a more dialectic relationship with those who are powerful in the world. I try to use a, a euphemism as, as complicated as possible, but a narrative of the Catholic Church that annoys those who are in power. And it's very clear that the most powerful nation in the world is still the United States. And, and this is a, a very important factor. Um, <coughs> Latin American Catholicism in the United States has been the object of a very careful scrutiny of, you know, of U.S. foreign policy, of U.S. intelligence for a very long time. So having a pope from Bavaria or from Poland or a pope from Argentina coming from the slums of Buenos Aires as a political as a geopolitical challenge that a European Pope doesn't present. We have to be very, very honest uh, about that without being uh, conspiracy-minded, but I've, I've studied diplomacy, I mean, Vatican uh, diplomacy. If you read what the embassies in Rome were saying in June 1963, before they elected the last Italian pope, Paul VI, all the ambassadors were saying, we cannot have a pope who is uh, acquiescent with communism. And I'm sure that there's a lot of this stuff in what ambassadors have been writing in these last five years. Something like that. I mean, this is very practical. So that is for North American Catholicism a specific kind of challenge because geopolitically North American Catholicism is now uh, exiting, is now making this exodus really after a very long period of two popes, John Paul and Benedict, who loved the United States of America. They loved it for different reasons. John Paul II because of uh, anti-communism and so on. And Pope Benedict because he, he saw in North American Catholicism an interesting response against a few excesses of liberal Catholicism. It, it's very clear. And now North American Catholics have to deal with this Pope that has no particular sympathy for North America. Uh, I, I'm not saying Pope Francis is anti-American, but in intellectual history, one of the pillars of Catholic culture in Europe, and after that in Latin America, was anti-Americanism. There's no question about that. And so here, and there is this perception that this Pope is bringing in the Vatican a, a geopolitical vision that is not as friendly to the United States as it used to be in the, in the previous 35 years at least. But we could go back to Paul VI, who was the first Pope going to the UN, uh, having this awkward relation. Uh, audience with, with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, but, but he, so we are exiting half a century of the Vatican that was on board with the United States for, for many reasons. So this Pope um, is different. Um, he is different because there are a few factors that I think say something on uh, why uh, this has become more visible. And of course, uh, we have, historically speaking, a certain kind of relationship in the first part of Pope Francis' pontificate until the end of 2016 under President Obama. And we have a different phase uh, with the, the, the election, and even before we, uh, the, the 
primaries leading to the, uh, the election of President Trump. <coughs> so here, it's undeniable that there is uh, a first time in history when a pope intervened in his own way in, 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 the, in the primaries in the, fame of, in, the, in the famous press conference he gave on the papal flight back from Mexico in February 2016 when he was asked by an American journalist based in Rome uh, what he thought of the idea of building a wall. And I think this journalist didn't expect a real answer. And the Pope gave a real answer. <laughs> he said, well, I mean, this, this kind of thinking is not Christian. He said, Italian. It was the first time that you, you had that kind of interaction. So it, there's no question that there is a new kind of tension between the Vatican and uh, the White House. This is new. It's, it's a reversal, a real reversal, not just from the, the entente, the, the, the mutual understanding between Francis and Obama. Because I, I think they understood that the kind of rejection they were both getting had something in common. And we could go into that. But, but it's a huge reversal from John Paul II and Ronald Reagan, or George W. Bush and Paul Benedict, where there was, I mean, there were tensions, there were disagreements, but there was a very solid transatlantic <laughs> geopolitical uh, axis uh, with a lot of problems, again, but that was not in question. One of the things that has happened is that Pope Francis reaching to the peripheries has made some natural and symbolical boundaries between the Vatican and politics much wider. So in Rome, the Tiber has become symbolically much wider because Pope Francis doesn't want to see any Italian politician. We make that clear, I don't want you to try to get my endorsement, so don't show up in the Vatican. So that's, he has made the, the Atlantic Ocean wider. It's a much wider ocean, not just politically, culturally, but also geopolitically. There's no real uh, common vision, as it used to be during the, the Cold War, uh, immediately after 9-11, so we are together in this fight. This is not... Uh, in this, paradoxically, there are some similarities between the impact of this pontificate on the world and the impact of this presidency on the world. So if Pope Francis has made the Atlantic Ocean wider, we could say the same thing for Donald Trump. Europe is a periphery for, for, for this presidency. So, that, so that's interesting. One other interesting thing is that once you had that for both the Vatican and the United States, Europe was the center of the world, or one of the centers of the, of the, of the world. Now, Pope Francis is doing anything he can to keep uh, the European Union on life support. He's trying. But Europe is certainly not at the center of his map. And we could say the same for Donald Trump. So Europe is, is being suddenly displaced by a pope that they love, but a really good doesn't see himself as part of the European project and a new American administration that is difficult to, uh, to, to, to interpret for uh, Europeans. So here, I want to conclude with four elements that I think are typical of this pontificate, not because of what 
this pope has done, but because of what this pope has revealed. So here we tend to think that the pope is the the CEO who makes decisions in, 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 in the Catholic Church. The pope is much more a witness of the tradition than a maker of the tradition. That, that's uh, I don't know if you have if you have seen the famous painting by Salvador Dali of Pope John the 23rd. And so Salvador Dali was, was uh, a semi-crazy guy. Uh, but deeply Catholic, culture deeply Catholic. Um, and he painted this, this picture of John the 23rd and the whole picture is an enormous ear. ear. Enormous ear. At the center of the, of the drum, is it called drum? There's a tiny icon of the Virgin Mary. So, the Pope is somebody who listens to what's happened. He is a big antenna. And actually, Pope Francis has used, has used the image of the antenna to describe what the Vatican should be. So, antenna for I mean, sending messages and to receive messages. So here there are a few messages that I think Pope Francis has captured with a remarkable depth. The first signal is that the Catholic Church globally is made of uh, plates, of tectonic plates. And what happens with tectonic plates is that they move. And so global Catholicism is made of plates that are moving and some of them are getting bigger like the global south the Australasian uh, Catholic plate is becoming much more Asian it's much less white, much less Irish <laughs> much more Asian so here it's a world that is made of plates they are, are moving and as it happens for plates tonic plates, they also collide sometimes, and they make earthquakes. So we have lived in the 20th century, between World War II and a few years ago, in a fairly stable Catholic geopolitics. Uh, I believe that there are a few signals that a few plates are uh, moving. Second is uh, that this pontificate reads the map of the Catholic Church and the global map with a theological map that wants to bring back to the action, to the words of the Pope, a theological message that is the message, as I said at the beginning, of God in his past. There, there is a deep solidarity between the Catholic Church and the world. And that solidarity sometimes has to be shown or, or performed at the expense of the business interests of the Catholic Church. There are costs, like what he's saying, in Europe, in Italy, in favor of migrants and, uh, and refugees, it scares many Catholics. Because Italy will, will become a, a, a different country. It's a fairly small country. So here he reads world map not geopolitically or politically or diplomatically without a theological reading of what the church is in uh, the modern world uh, is that he wants to do what the Vatican II tried to do 50 years ago and if you want one definition of, of what the Vatican II tried to do is to make the Catholic Church look more like Jesus Christ and less like the Roman Empire which is a huge undertaking it's a huge undertaking so there is a radicality of what he wants to do, 
that is trying to do that is challenging for, for some ideas of stability. So which was one of the typical concerns of the popes of all of the all, all of the popes of the 19th and of the 20th century. Uh, a third element is that this pope has understood that the most important sign of our time, so what defines our times, is the issue of mass movements of, of population migrants, refugees. Uh, so when I, I was a teenager, the symbol of the world was the Berlin Wall. I mean, everything revolved around the Berlin Wall. Where you stand on that, on that side, on the other side, it was one symbol. The symbol of today are the, are the, are the refugee camps. In Greece, in Turkey, in Italy. So he has made of that uh, one of the keys to read the world. In other words, he sees a world of people who are resettling and not a world made of nations of settlers. It's a huge difference how you look at your community, your family, your nation, your continent. He has an idea of a world that is moving on the shoulders of those who have to leave their, uh, their countries because they, they are persecuted, because there's war, because there's famine. Uh, fourth and final is this. This pope is very interesting because he comes from a deeply urban, inner city experience. For him, the world is a city. Uh, he has an urban imaginary. Uh, he has been a bishop of a city where Catholics are a minority, uh, multicultural, uh, in the peripheries of the world. It's a world that is very much secular, uh, so he, his imaginary is cosmopolitan, is uh, pluralistic. Um, he identifies that with spaces to, to open space for God, which is one of the differences with, uh, with the North American experience where the city is more associated with abandoning God, leaving God behind. This is so one of the differences between his experience and, uh, and uh, this part of uh, the world. So here, I don't know how many years uh, Pope Francis uh, has uh, but it's clear that observing him from a North American point of view offers a very particular perspective. And on the other hand, it offers also a theologian uh, looking at this pontificate from, from America some elements that are evidently missing from his attention, like a certain the way of talking uh, about s some issues and I cannot ignore these last few weeks have been marked by uh, the revelation that he didn't handle properly a case of sex uh, abuse of an appointment of a bishop who had been accused of covering up for sex abuse and so this is something that a North American Catholic can perceive much better than. So here, it, it, it's a complicated church. It's a very interesting church. And this Pope has shown a few aspects that I believe are very, very fascinating. Um, and all we would like to know, we will know in 50 years probably, when all documents will be declassified and so on. But there is a lot already that we can see. 
and I, I hope uh, what I said was not too obscure, was uh, uh, the beginning of the conversation and I would be happy to answer your question or hear your comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you for such a multifaceted, complex, rich uh, presentation. I told you, I promised you, it would give us much to provoke thought and conversation. So, uh, what we'll do is move that microphone here, and for people who have questions, just come up to the mic and ask your question, and Massimo, you can use this uh, mic. We'll do that for about uh, 10 minutes or so. <coughs> Oh, am I going to break this? Oh. There you go. And, and you might introduce yourself to the camera. I'm Tom Forte. Uh, thank you so much, Massimo. Uh, you, you mentioned the tectonic plates and said there were some signals of movement. Can you talk a little more about maybe what some of those are sure. and what are the signals that you're observing? Sure. Well, so, as I said, uh, we uh, have been disabused of the notion that there is one American continent. So this is very evident. Uh, it is uh, economic, NAFTA, social, if I look at Europe, for example, the, uh, European Catholicism is being redefined by immigration. So, most Catholics in Sweden now were born in the Middle East. So what is Swedish Catholicism today? It's, it's very hard. And so it, it is much more complicated. Uh, there's the whole issue of so with China. As you know, the Vatican is, uh, is negotiating with the Chinese government to reach a, an agreement to reunify two different hierarchies of bishops, those who are faithful to the Chinese government, and those which are called underground bishops who refuse to, to obey the Chinese government. That is if that happens, it's something of huge proportions because the I mean, wrong way to look at that is in, in ideological terms, in communism and the communism. But as we all know, I mean, China is an empire that now happens to look communist now. But this is not the importance. Okay. It's no longer the host politic with, with Russia in the 1960s, 70s. So, if the Catholic Church is acknowledged by the Chinese government, it's a remarkable thing. And we don't know what happened, so what that means. But it's. Uh, so, here there. So, one of the, oh, the, oh, the factors is that. We tend to think about Catholicism being diverse globally because there are I mean, African Catholics, Chinese Catholics, Asian Catholics. But we are now realizing that there are in each local church, there is already in many local churches, especially in big cities, there are worlds. I, I don't know in how many languages they celebrate Mass in Los Angeles every Sunday, or New York. And so this is a different Catholicism from 50 years ago. And so here, it's a challenge for the Catholic Church, because at Vatican II, Vatican II accepted the idea of a diverse church globally. But back then, the idea was we accept the idea that there is a global Catholic Church that is made of nations. And back then it was one nation, one language, basically. This is no, no longer the, the situation. So 
So now, I don't want to talk uh, about the legitimacy of the nation state, which is... So the Catholic Church accepted the, the legitimacy of the nation state one generation before it collapsed. I mean, it's a typical Catholic, I mean, coming too late to the dinner. I mean, that's, but it, it's a, 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 huge, a huge phenomenon. And so here, the talk about diversity is not about how to bring more voices from Africa to the Vatican, but how to make Catholics coexist in local churches where there are <coughs> liturgical traditions, political sensibilities, uh, ethnic tensions, and that was once an exception. Now it's, it's the normal situation. So here, it's, I, I don't know what will happen. I, I, I think something has happened, and this pontificate is about uh, about opening our eyes to what our church is, without thinking that if we make world Catholicism more European, we'll be fine. Because I don't, I don't believe that's going to work. Honestly. Um, you mentioned the um, Vatican Council and post-Vatican Council and how the U.S. and North America is different. And if we look at present day, an observation I think a number of us had, the priests coming out of baths and seminaries, I'm trying to avoid the, word, the label conservative, are desiring Latin masses, part, part of masses Latin, um, changes moving backward based on documents, a legalism. Could you speak to that as far as cause, dynamics, what you've observed yeah. in your years here? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think you were right. I mean, this is what I have, I have seen. Uh, I think this is an American phenomenon may be less, less special of America than other phenomena. So this is a trend that we see in other nations, including China, for example. Which, I mean, for Chinese priests, this attraction for Latin is puzzling to me. But anyway, so, so you're right. I think what's happened, and this is something I'm really serious, I'm seriously thinking hard in these last few months, really, is that we, I mean, Vatican II Catholics, or those who have studied Vatican II, we have underestimated the shock that the changes of the Second Vatican Council uh, have caused. And so what's happening right now, so what started to happen at the end of John Paul, the entire Benedict, and right now, is a pushback. Uh, so the impression is, the, is, the, is that Vatican II uh, desacralized liturgy, uh, was uh, anything goes Catholicism. So they perceive that, the, the 1970s and so on, as what basically destroyed Catholicism. And they want to rebalance that. The problem with this rebalancing is that I see sometimes they don't fight the extremes. Because there were extremes. I mean, if you go on YouTube, you can find any kind of stuff. So we had extremes, and that's perfectly normal in any post battle period, in any post council period. So they are not saying we should get rid of the abuses, which is good. But they say the entire Vatican II documents included 
that is bad theology. We should go back to the 1950s or 1850s or 1350s. Okay. So that's the problem. So what happened in this last decade or so, at the beginning was Vatican II is good, the spirit of Vatican II is bad because it allowed people to come up with things that they shouldn't have done. And that was John Paul II and Benedict basically. They say Vatican II is good, the documents are good, if we follow documents are good, a few experiments were bad. What we are, the situation we are right now with that kind of priest or of intellectuals is that they have made of both the documents of the council and of what happened after that do. They are all bad. And they don't realize that the, the documents of the Second Vatican Council are the basic code, the software with which Catholicism functions today. I mean, I, I don't think they understand what it means to say we should go back and <coughs> baptize Jews because if we don't baptize them, they're going to hell. Or say religious liberty, yes, but for Catholics concerns only. Or to say uh, we should uh, withdraw our obedience to the political authorities because our real king is Jesus Christ. So they are. So these are things that are entertaining at a dinner party, not for me. But they are theologically extremely dangerous and wrong because they go against everything these last popes of these last 50 years have said. All of them, John Paul II, Mandy, so, so, but you have that kind of stuff. So here, we tend to make fun of priests, of young priests who love laces, Latin, incense, this kind of thing. But that is just the surface. Behind that, there is sometimes a narrative of the real Catholicism is the, is the, the one who works without Vatican II. And it's like saying, I mean, the, 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 the analogy is not perfect, but it's like saying the only way America can work is without the Constitution. Let's go back to the Pilgrim Fathers. Well, good luck with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fancy dream, but it's very dangerous. So, what I think I have underestimated, or some people in my profession have underestimated, I have, I have underestimated that for sure, is the, uh, the vigor of that reaction. That is there, and I don't think we can uh, think that it will go away. I mean, there are not many priests or, or seminarians now, and many of them are like that. And I think they may grow, they may to face the real world, work with women in, in a parish, and so on. But this is not just because they are young. It's because of the theological education that they sometimes receive. So here there is a world in the Catholic Church that we should really take a hard look at. Because it tends, it worries me a lot worries me a lot, and um, as I said, it's more visible in the U.S. because Vatican II is like the 60s, Woodstock, smoking pot, these kind of things. And so they don't divide, they say it's the same thing. Vatican II is 
is the ecclesiastic uh, version of Woodstock for them. Which is crazy, which is crazy, but, but that is... So here, I, I think Catholics who care for Vatican II and the Church of Saint Catholic, they should re-examine the issue of the tradition, because this is our problem today. What is the tradition? in a non-traditionalist way, so in a dynamic way, and so tradition evolves, but a tradition that exists, exists, it's not something that is buried in the past, and we can build the future Catholicism without foundation, because that is sometimes what you have. So here there is a huge work to be done, and here Francis, I think, has done, because he is a very traditional book, He's a very traditional pope. He's, he's not building a church out, but he was elected in a church that was right in the middle of this new traditionalist insurgency. And this is a, a big problem because uh, it tends to offer a vision of what Catholicism is that is disconnected from what the church officially teaches. Uh, here, I, I taught seminarians for a few years when, when, when I, I, I was in Minnesota. And it, it's, it's interesting work that liberal Catholic theologians should be forced to do. <laughs> if, if, if I were Pope, I would mandate this, because this is, uh, so, so we have two, two parts of the, of the, of the church that now tend to ignore one another. First of all, thank God I'm not an administrator. That's the first thing. No, I think that there is a huge issue with diversity uh, that cannot be easily solved by hiring <coughs> faculty that are non-white or non-male. There is an issue of ideological diversity that is there. And I think that uh, it is very difficult. I understand that. But we need, in some way, to have our uh, departments of theology less detached from what the real church is. It's conservative elements, uh, so that's one thing, and it's very difficult. I, I don't deny that it's very difficult, but this is the only way I think to to do that. And second, uh, I don't have any particular example in mind, but in these last few decades, the main concern of uh, Catholic universities was to be free from interventions from the institution, from the bishop. I think we have a bigger problem now. So we have to go back to the idea that teaching theology in a Catholic university has an ecclesial dimension, that you speak also <coughs> on behalf of the church in some way. And this is something academics tend to be allergic to because there's the idea that only academic excellence counts and your ecclesial commitments are not relevant. I, I don't see a future for Catholic theology without recovering some kind of ecclesial commitment. And I'm not saying that if you teach Sunday school 
you will be promoted if you don't. You know, I, I'm not saying that, but in the ethos, there is that to recover. And this is one of the things that we should understand. We are not. We are no longer in the 1960s, 70s, when the issue of independence from the bishop was most important. Now, if we wanna. I think if you want to if you want to follow Pope Francis, we should leave behind fears that were were, were typical of 50 years ago, or 40 years ago, or 30 years ago, and look at other fears that are more present to me. So, which is all the theology that is uh, is uh, disconnected from uh, the, uh, from the church. I I, I think he is a house of it can become a house of cards. In the end, uh, Madam Press, for just a minute. Thank you again for your presentation. I think it's great. I was just wondering, along with that, if you would please, on the phone, Julie. Um, going, back, well, um, going back to what uh, the Catholic Church was looking at more inwardly before Vatican II, and that, again, might be that stability that priests are looking for. In that internal looking, that external piece that actually Vatican II has opened up. Do you see us moving with the tectonic plates moving in those crashes that you talked about? Do you see us moving more towards um, more towards the salvation story or away from the salvation story with with trying to get people closer to the whole of the Catholic Church with those potential for those collisions and less ecclesiology and things that are coming? into the future. This is kind of the big yeah, yeah. So it's a challenge and are we getting closer or further away from the salvation story? Well I I don't know. I mean it's way above my my pay level to uh, see. I think that we are witnessing a rebalancing of the impact of the Second Vatican Council. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. So there are some orthodoxies in the Catholic Church that were built in the 1970s or 80s. And I don't see myself really part of them. And I don't think Catholics that are in my classroom are, are even aware of that. So I... I Deeply, deeply convinced that there is no th no possible future of the second of, of the Catholic Church without Vatican II. I don't think Vatican II is the last word, so there will be another development. But for now, I don't see any alternative to De Verbo or Luna Gentium. So this is my concern too recover the center of the spectrum that has been left to the to the weeds and very few Catholics have cultivated that middle area uh, and I, I don't blame them I, I, I don't want to sound the only one saying these things I, I'm not the only one saying these things but I think it's a task of my generation and of the oh, and the, and the other theologians to reoccupy the center of the spectrum because these last few years have been two aisles. And I, I see that most of the divisions right now are around how to deal with the shock of the Catholic Church that is no longer the dominating religion, the dominating church. This is the, the, the biggest shock. So there is a historical issue, an issue of the tradition. I don't think that any pope in these last 50 years ever dreamed of, of bringing us back to the 1950s. That's not Catholicism. But it's an argument that has to be made. It's not natural <coughs> for, for people like me who have studied Vatican II their own lives. It tends to be automatic. Of course, if you're a Catholic, you are into Vatican II. 
doesn't work anymore. So we have to re-narrate that story and to say why it makes sense not to say that Jews go to hell. <coughs> so, so why theologically it makes sense? Because all the questions that we, we thought we had given solutions to are coming back. And I don't think that answers to all the questions can be found in the church of the fourth millennium. They have to be found in a moment that's closer to us. Uh, and it's work. There's a lot to do there for <coughs> all of us. I guess that, that point is, is it, as we're broadening, is it getting more accepting as Vatican II is looking externally and God in the skies in the modern world to be more inclusive, where some of those things that we're talking about bring us back to a center to where it's, it's less inclusive? I think there's no option for the future of the church to be less, uh, less inclusive. I mean, just to be very blunt, one of the, of, the, of, the, of the reasons some Catholics don't see Francis as a real pope is because they don't see him as a white Catholic. <coughs> Being very blunt, extremely blunt. A Latin American Catholic is not really white. As white as a European pope is. So this is a real challenge. So how diverse, I, I don't, I mean, if we think that our, that, that our church can be less inclusive, we're going towards extinction. So it's a logical thing. Okay, thank you. Oh, one last question. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't thank you all. Oh, thanks. Hi, I'm Devin. Um, so as a person who works with young American college students. Um, how do you find Pope Francis and his relationship with the U.S. Catholic Church affecting them, especially since we're in a room full of young American Catholic college students? It's a, it's a very good question, and that allows me to end on a higher note, you know, on a summer. I mean, my experience is that most of them, they see that this Pope is not about the church, but it's about Jesus Christ. Which sounds obvious, but for the Catholic Church is not obvious at all. It's not, I'm, if you go to, uh, 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 to the Vatican, Rome, St. Peter, so you enter, and you have two huge statues, left and right of St. Peter, on horses, and they're not two saints, they're two emperors, Constantine and Charlemagne. And so saints are inside. I mean, <laughs> but so when you enter, you know, well, this kind of church is about something very practical. So here, Pope Francis is really giving us what it was about that this church dies or survives depending on its ability to <coughs> deliver something that's very close to Jesus. I mean, nobody can be really be as Jesus, but I, I think that's the future. That's, and this is complicated because as a Pope, you are a CEO, you are a head of state, you are a human resource. I mean, it's a very complicated. But the most original moment it's when he delivers the gospel message, which, as we know, is sometimes very unpopular. I see that, and there's a lot to be said uh, about what he's, he's doing about that. Thank you, Dr. Fetterman. Thank you so much for the powerful, provocative, complex thoughts. Um, it's given us a lot to continue the conversation before you leave. Um, I want to invite you to uh, share some of the reception food here. Uh, Dr. Fagioli will be here for a little bit more if you want to talk to him.
And I'd like to invite everyone to our next um, lecture uh, from the uh, Curtis Center for uh, Catholic Contemporary Conversations on February 28th. We'll have Dr. Michael Lee from Fordham University who will be talking about Oscar Romero. But again, Dr. Fagioli, thank you so much.